Welcome to the VRIC channel. My name is Jay Martin, and my guest today is Francis Hunt, the market sniper, the reset sniper, and the crypto sniper. Those are his platforms. And today we get into some bold forecasts for $2,900 gold, $50 silver, $30 oil, and a handful of other predictions. Super fun chatting with Francis. I hope you enjoy this. If you enjoy my content, this interview, beneath this piece of content, there is a link where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter. I publish every Sunday. I decompress from interviews just like this and dozens more, both here on the VRIC channel and on the Jay Martin Show. Love to have you sign up and join the team of over 40,000 investors who hear from me every Sunday. I love writing it. Would love to have you join that tribe. Here is Francis Hunt. Enjoy. Here we are. I am joined by Francis Hunt, the market sniper. Francis, it's great to finally have you on the channel. Thanks for making the time. Absolute pleasure. Delighted to be with you, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Now, pleasure's all mine. So there's a few directions I want to go today. I'm excited to chat with you, pick your brain, find out where you're allocating capital, what you're most concerned about, macro speaking, and why. We're going to jump into all that stuff. Just because it's your first time on the channel, for anybody who's not familiar, could you give us the high-level break, high breakdown, Francis, of how you spend your day? And that'll give us some context. 100%. Well, uh, brand-wise, we focused on three core circles um, inside of our brand. That was the crypto sniper, which is obviously very industry-specific. It's this future blockchain, the role that it's going to play in, I suspect, a future money system. The, the reset sniper is very focused on who's driving what, uh, and it deals with social as well as the things outside of what I'd describe as overtly financial. So the events of March 2020 could be falling into that uh, and the drivers behind that and what views you tend to have. And then the market sniper itself is the technical chart. So when you look at our branding, you see the little uh, snail in there. That's the Fibonacci. That is very much looking at the markets. So the, the ideology behind that, and it starts with the Hunt Volatility Funnel Theory that we developed is we can see where things are going through the footprints in the sand don't listen to what they say, whoever you want to call they, um, look at what they do. Uh, and we tend to see in the markets shifting. And there's often a point of suspense as well before you get a violent move. In other words, things go exceedingly quiet and low volatility often just before they absolutely detonate. So volatility is like the tide, it comes in and it draws out. And when it gets super low, when you have extremely low tide, it's often the precursor to a tidal wave if it goes uh, very far out. And that actually allows people to have disproportionate trades uh, in terms of reward to associated risk. So when you get very tight price behavior, you can set tight stops. You can you one of those rare moments where you can use leverage and then you can get an explosive gain. So we are looking to maximize. So the market type uh, circle is looking to maximize wealth in reset times with also an eye on the future, which is the crypto, the blockchain and the future of money. So that's the entire circle. And we, they're overlapping three circles and we want to put you continually in there. So the sniping is actually nailing that spot that gives you the best understanding in all three of those aspects. Uh, and that's kind of where we are. In terms of, you know, we've called the Euro Swiss franc peg fails a number of times. We were the only person to say single digit oil that I ever know of when it was in the, the low 70s and in the mid 60s, pre the March 2020 events. And this you can only see technically. And the news follows. The news follows. News trading is is, is the wrong way around. Uh, I was guessing, why am I shorting cruise liners that have an input of uh, oil being one of their biggest costs? And I've never been a bigger bear in my life I'm, I'm uh, on oil. And the answer came. It was, you know, old, old sweethearts uh, rekindling their youth on a cruise where there's a virus that is particularly dangerous to the elderly. Uh, was not a good game. And that was the answer. So we get the story afterwards. You have to learn, and I call these the inversion perversion times, if you'll excuse a bit of phraseology. But you have to learn to actually get things back to front uh, because the answer often comes later. Yeah, no doubt. Okay, so thank you for explaining the ecosystem and how you balance those three buckets. So what do you, I mean, right before I hit record, you said, uh, you know, we're getting the sense that something big is about to happen and we're looking at the footprints. So what are you seeing and how much can you speculate about what you're expecting? 
So it's an excellent question. Before I answer the specifics, I also want to map the garden that we played in. So you've asked me about the rose bush, and I'm just defining the entire boundary of the garden. It's our overall view macroeconomically that we are in what a phrase we've coined to fit the times, hyper-stagflationary era. So it's not just a normal stagflation. Many people use what I refer to as associative thinking. Oh, it's going to be like the 70s. That's a very dangerous thing. We cling to things we know or we've experienced before. It's going to be far more extreme and it's far more global, in our opinion, than uh, the 70s as it goes down. It's also the, the night that followed the Goldilocks Greenspan era that was the day. So you have to understand the, um, the beautiful balance of the world. Um, the Goldilocks era was the globalization trend which saw uh, China eventually be outsourced for everything in manufacturing, not just India, of course, and other emerging market nations that led to consumer pricing staying consistently very, very low so that Greenspan ran a much um, softer monetary policy that allowed asset prices to hyperinflate. So we've actually had inflation throughout the 90s, and all of that, but it's been asset price inflation. And hence you had the era of search for yield. Everybody, wow, everything's so expensive and yielding so little. So the bond markets right, right down and capital value gains paying naught to zero in some cases in Europe, even negative yields, guaranteed losses. Uh, and this was the search for yield era. It's our opinion um, as part of still defining this larger garden that um, we are now in the opposite, which is six months of day. If you go to the North Pole, that's awesome. But then if you're still there, you've got six months of night. So this isn't a very positive message. I'm wearing a black shirt. It's sounding a bit black pill today. Um, but in the essence, you can't booze it up, take the drugs, not sleep, party on, um, on all the other stuff, and then not have the knock-on effect of afterwards. So that's the binge. But this is a 40-year binge. The last time we had some semblance of dis discipline on monetary uh, policy, in our opinion, was the Falker era. And that also coincided with a major gold and silver event, which I'll be coming back to now. So March 2020 was, for us, the end of that. In other words, we assessed that bonds will never be so highly valued and the yield that, that they will pay will never be so low. And we said that in August of the same year. And at the same time, March 2020, we had a super spike in the gold-silver ratio. So in our point of view, there was a, a clear inflection point from the end of the 40 years of daylight to what I'm now calling the, I don't know if it's going to be the exact geometric. It might be more intense and end quicker. But you've got to eat the same amount of darkness uh, in terms of feel good factor and growth. So everyone was mass affluent. Everyone had a home. There was an ATM that you could refi during that 40 year period. It was the mass affluence. Now we're going to have a sustained period of stagnation combined with ridiculously firm and uh, dogged inflation. Uh, and uh, this is where we are at now. And the Fed is in that current dilemma. And one of the reasons bringing it to more current now is that they are aggressive and continuing to assert aggressiveness on interest rate policy, longer or higher for longer, in an environment where there is quite clear signs that uh, the economy is in quite some trouble. Uh, as outside of the non-farm payrolls number, which I can allude to in a minute, um, there's clear signs labor is turning down. You've had six or seven months of housing turning down. You've got clear, clear signs of liquidity coming out of the system. You've got subprime auto. You've got all of these things. So the financial engineering period up to March 2020 was so extreme, we now have to detox that. This is going to see asset price contraction, and this is going to be devastating for the middle classes. And our reset hat expects that historically. So it looks at the Bolshevik revolution, who was actually targeted, where are they wanting to take us? That's speculative. It can be considered conspiratorial by many people, but I'm afraid to say the sights are on the big middle. Uh, and often that doesn't mean it's not going to hurt the poor as well, but often the, the poorer classes are weaponized. So it's part of getting the crabs in the bucket to fight. So this points to social unrest, contraction, um, reduction of leverage, and a lot of statism and statist intervention. So you're now to get your question, because that was quite a lot of, uh, I suppose, scene setting. 
Um, what are we seeing right now? Well, we are anticipating what we call a DGE, a demand destroying event that is similar to what the effects that uh, what of March 2020, but it'll probably be more fiscal, financial. It could be geopolitical. So as as again, we don't know any better than anybody else what form that will take. But we see a contraction in the markets because they're going to keep the pain down. So it's a waterboarding situation, and I'm holding your head under the water longer than is fair. Normally, I'm pulling you up every 30 seconds and you're gasping and now you're under for a minute and a bit and you're starting to struggle. Um, and this is where factually I feel the economy is. It's weak, it's soft, and it's going to be made to suffer more so on account that they've now got to fight two doubly stubborn events. The inflation, which is the hyper stagflation part, and then they're going to have this very sensitive to growth. The consumer is pretty destroyed. Uh, at the moment. So we're seeing technical signs of certain industries, sectors, certain uh, uh, individual shares that we think will go down uh, quite substantially. And um, we're seeing a little bit of stress in the bond market that is getting super tight that we expect to break out in one or two directions, either a sudden spike to the upside, which could mean fear about inflation, which will then bring on the demand destroying event when they they up higher or more, or it's going to be a breakdown. So I will, I can potentially, when we go to charts, I can refer, show you the Italian and the 10 year and the 30 year US, uh, how I'm seeing something really tightening. So we're going to have a breakout. If it's to the downside, that is then pain and suffrage. And then the fact that uh, the rates will probably come down, but it might be up first. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. Let's go to the charts now because I wanted to pull on which technical signs you're paying the most attention to to build this conviction. Yes. And in fact, I might I might counterintuitively just start you on gold uh, and show you a couple of things. One of the reasons why uh, I want to show you on gold is that is our go to because one of your preempting possibly one of your future questions is going to be, you know, where do people hide? And I'm not sure I'm going to be that different from many other people that have already been on your show. Um, but the anti fiat which is physical um, and can't easily be taken off you. In other words, it's not in a system, it's not in a grid, it's not electronic money in a bank, is, is in fact gold. And our view is that you've got a 2,905 first leg up. That's not the end, but we probably rest on a technical run of 3,000 uh, charts uh, to, to hit you. However, shorter term, so we, when we talk charts, it's always about what is your time frame that you're talking about it. So it's important to assert that macro, we are bulls. And by the way, on the oil crash trade, we were at the same time long gold. So you had a commodity delta neutral trade there. And throughout that period, uh, gold did exceedingly well. This, if we go to the monthly chart, just to give a little bit of macro perspective, that essentially was the March 2020 events. In a single month, you pull back there and then you were going back up and you made the high whilst oil at that same time fell from low 70s, mid 60s, right down to a cash market of zero and negative on the futures. So that was a, you know, a really nice counterbalancing trade in the commodities. What we're seeing right now, shorter term, is that gold is actually battling with the historical. Not many people will, will say that, we're all bulls fundamentally, but at the moment we're battling with the technical level around 2000. Uh, so we have a technical level at about 2000, and we are uh, struggling to hold above it. And this is the third time. And I, I assess we'll have a degree of pullback. And this dovetails a little bit with a bit of demand destroying event and a little bit of fear and a, maybe a bit of bid coming in on the dollar. Um, so the dollar in terms of our categorization is king fiat. So what's good for, uh, you know, fiat is particularly good for the, the dollar and is bad for anti-fiat, which could be the group of Bitcoin, gold and uh, silver. So we're getting a little bit of a bid coming under the dollar. We're getting these are called technical shooting stars over here. Uh, so people don't need to uh, stress too much about it. It has a name, but the candle is very small. In fact, that's a doji virtually. So that just means the open is the same as the current load. We're not finished the month, but this is an exhaustive 
typically bidder price behavior. So that means we've got up to that key level. That normally means you're going to pull back, wind up to go higher. Why wind up to go higher? Why is it not a reversal? Some people might be saying, but a triple top, for example, that's a known um, technical uh, 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 structure as well. Why are you bullish? And our inherent bullishness comes, uh, and I'll just take put the eye back on. You'll see there's a big flag in there. It's a bit messy, so I'll, I'll draw it freestyle with an overlay. Um, we do a lot of work on the charts all the time, but you'll see that there is inherently our assessment that you are in a form of continuation structure here. Uh, and this is the structure that gives you the 3,000 run, the two nines into the two nines, this leg up over there. However, before you do that, you have to make the new technical high. And we are faltering at this level. This move was one of the strongest moves up inside of the continuation pattern. So everything since the high that was over here, this has all been continuation. And you'll probably recall that as being uh, 2020s, back end of 2020s. So we've, we are 23 now. So it's a two and a half year consolidation. Uh, but when you catch the runs, you you catch them really well. And you're at 1150, you're through 2000s. Uh, and that multiplier factor when you apply it to mines and various other things, and of course, silver as well, there's there's uh, multiples on the higher beta. So my assessment is we get a small pullback back into the range, but we do not visit this low range, not at a horizontal level or even worse, at a, a, a down level again. That we pull in, we'll form some form of rest, and then we will break. So it's just not the time right now for people to throw on max leverage longs into your gold market. and uh, But there will be, if you're dollar cost averaging, opportunity to continue to accumulate slightly cheaper. If you have a lump sum, you might be paid uh, to wait a little bit. You might get lower 1900s as uh, a technical entry point. But the longer term is very, very uh, optimistic. And that would, as I've said, will take you up to, and I'll show you uh, again, that draw up there, we're seeing the 2,900s being uh, run uh, as a result of that. And coincident with that is the silver run, which will take you back up to its legacy highs. So silver is lagging gold. So gold has got three touches, as we've already described now at its highs, a smaller rest to come back, far smaller than that and that one, and then a winding up process. Silver will get, when gold gets to 2.9, to approximately the 46 to 48, uh, $49 range. Hold For on, those one, are... one, one question I have. Could you, could you expand a bit on your um, speculation to $2,900 gold for me? Certainly. So where does that number come from? The number comes from a, a technical pattern that we will be, just for simplicity, be referring to as a flag structure. Uh, and flagging is where you have a weak counter trend move of consolidation, which in my assess assessment, we've already probably technically broke and we'll have a, a small revisit before we go. And the targeting comes from the expectation that the, the the pole of the flag is geometrically reproduced. So the amount of uh, bullishness you get to the upside, how much you rest and sag and exhaust afterwards, and then that same energy brought to bear again has a tendency to give you a very good guide as to where you're going to end up. To be clear, there'll be some metals bulls that be getting frustrated. That's not the top call at two nine. That's another pause period potentially for uh, on shorter time frames, minor reversals or, or consolidation again before more. So that that's where that uh, number comes from. Just as an interest, we did the same thing. You're going to find this particularly interesting, uh, Jay, as a smart man who likes to see. And, and I like to see technical cross verifying each other. When I go to the silver market and do the same, um, you'll see how we get also to the uh, 46, 45 to 46, uh, 48 range. You'll see it as well. Um, that's our 45 range. And that's coming out of the same flagging structure. Now, the interesting thing on the silver side is when I go to gold silver ratio, we have an another technical view. And when I calculate 
what the gold silver ratio will be and what gold's price at 2905 will be i get that same target for silver so it's kind of a different chart giving me a different uh potential uh, giving me the same potential outcome and we call that as confluence so what's the technical call on the gold silver ratio the gold silver ratio here's that blow off event that we say is potentially the bookmark end of the 40 year of financialization of everything. So our point is debt will never be seen as positively and as safe haven-esque as it was at that moment. And gold and silver will never be seen uh, as poorly, particularly silver, which is the gold silver ratio as that uh, capitulation moment of 128. So this is a head and shoulder structure that we see going down to 32 ounces. There's scope. Remember, head and shoulders, the beginning of a reversal. It doesn't mean it's the end of the move. It'll probably rally a bit, but it can go lower as well. And we have this broadening structure on our right shoulder over here. Uh, and this is typical. This is volatility. And it is typical of a major hit down. When you've had a really hard, sharp slap in the face, you get a degree of reaction. But a broadening structure is actually continuation to the downside, in our opinion. So we feel that we're going to break down out of this uh, technical chart to the neckline. Uh, and I'll just drop it a little bit, drop the time frames a little bit. Uh, you've seen the gold. And by the way, the reason why we say gold will rest and silver will rest, you see this is actually going up at the moment. So it's a counter trend period. And that's not bullish. You want this chart down. Um, and we're getting a counter trend rally up to these levels. I do not see it taking out that high. And our anticipation is you're going to get something like this. And then you break down to the 65, which is when you're going to get a first meaningful rally again. So when I take 65, the neckline, which is a logical round number of the structure, and I say silver, where if, if they are 60, if gold's at 2,000, 3,000, let's just keep them as simple. It's at 3,000 and the gold silver ratio is at 65. If you do the math and I'll do it with you, you'll see that we're at about 45 to $46 range. Uh, for fun, we'll do that together. 3,000 and we divide by 65. So this move, we first have to return to this neckline as part of a much bigger macro move and you get $46. Um, I'm not sure if that's uh, big for you. So let me just make the calculator a bit bigger for a yeah, second. No, it's all good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th that will be part and parcel of that one leg. Don't forget, we've got the move to 32. And during that period, gold could be going higher. So it's quite easy to say, well, what if gold was 5,000 and we're down at 32? You divide 5,000 by 32 and you start to get much more interesting numbers for silver. And that will mean new highs. But at the 46 that you saw, silver will be at the stage gold is now. Gold is three times kissing its legacy high and needing a pullback and a little bit of a rest before it goes higher. At that level, silver will then have been there because it's been sub 50, just sub 50, 2011, the 80s, and again, only the silver rests are much bigger in between. So the scale typically will imply also the scale of the move will be significantly higher. So that, that's a little bit about the metals. Um, you did ask, why is it precarious? Where is it getting scary? Why are we bearish um, at the moment? So I want to also highlight a couple of things. Oil is the energy markets of the world in essence. So it's deliveries of purchases, it's packaging. I, I like it as a proxy generally for activity, economic activity as well. Um, and it's a very important, obviously, it does, goes without saying it's one of the, it's a two trillion market. Uh, and you actually had a production cut in oil. Uh, and this was agreed. Uh, the previous time in March 2020, the Soviets, or the Russians, I should say, sorry, I'm going a bit old school there, the Russians and the Saudis failed to agree uh, production cuts. And that was part and parcel of the absolute collapse in the oil price. What happened differently this time is they preemptively got together. And before oil has even meaningfully sold off, I'll pull up the Western Texas intermediate contract, before it even meaningfully uh, sold off, they, gave a, they did a cut. And that, of course, bumped the price. So if I just go to the three day over here, you can see there was a gap there. Actually, it was better on the weekly. You can see there was a gap up. That was them announcing a production cut. Now, I want to highlight, nobody does a production cut in an environment where there's tons of oil being demanded and people are just, more oil, please, more consumption required, please send us more oil. 
That is a price protection behavior. In other words, they're right-sizing down the demand to try to retain, because they're not working against each other this time, they're working together, the price. So they want to retain pricing power in an environment where there is a contraction or a perception of a contraction. And if we divide this, I'm going to take the dollar out of the this because I'm throwing a lot at you here, but we're going to divide by the Dixie, which is a, a broader overall currency feel. And again, we have a head and shoulder structure here that we feel is going to play out on the oil markets. Uh, so this points again to, in my opinion, a demand destroying event, a big head. Uh, we call that we call that high having called the low. So oil, for whatever reason, we've done pretty well on as a core. We don't get everything right all the time, but we feel this is a struggle. This gap has been closed now, and then it started to plunge, and you've got a bit of plunge protection, but it's looking weak over here. So we are seeing 0.38. Now, that's in Dixies. Remember, the Dixies are around 100 uh, odd. 102 to the dollar at the moment. So we're looking at a low 40s, possibly into the threes dollar event again. So as someone who, who was engaged and said, big news, we're going single digits, you've got that same guy showing up uh, three, four years later saying, what kind of economy are we in if demand is going to fall into the 30s? again on dollars, upper 30s, or maybe the low 40s. So I'm using a Dixie here. It's not the dollar. Uh, but this is structurally looking concerning for me. This is in an environment natural gas has already collapsed. Uh, and the great unloved uranium is looking a little under stress too. Um, so this is energies are very, very interesting for me. And I think they will also precurse the weakness of the global demand that people are not yet feeling. Because you might be saying, I'm not making quite the same I used to do. Maybe there's a commission element. Maybe there's a click element. But you're not going to assume that the global economy is going down. Energies and uh, surveys and lots of other things are the things that are going to highlight to you what's happening. And they lag. Most things we love lead. And that's why I often refer to the yield curve inversion. So I'm taking you on a lot of journeys and you, you feel free to stop me. Uh, at any point, because these things all tie together. The yield curve inversion has never been so deep. Uh, it, that's not entirely correct. I would say in the modern era, post 80s, it's never been this deep. Uh, so if you look at the 10 years, the 30 years, minus the shorter terms, we've never fallen so far so bad. And this is again, illustrating to us that debt markets are also part of the huge problem. And one of the things, we, uh, pre the interview, I, one of the things I really wanted to help people, viewers, your viewers understand, is that currency and fiat money is borrowed into existence. Debt markets matter. They're actually bigger than the total market cap of all the summation of the equity markets, but you're not encouraged to know about them. But that is money being borrowed into existence. And a major devaluation in the debt market, someone... If you have an asset, the bank is your uh, has the liability if, uh, if you've deposited with them. You are a creditor. They are a debtor to you. If you borrow, you uh, they are the creditor and you are the debtor to them. So uh, the, every piece of fiat has this T, accounting, asset and liability. The loss of value in debt, and, uh, and I think it will become disorderly because the people will realize it and they're going to stampede out of it. Uh, and the Fed is the biggest buyer now. China is distributing. And what are the central banks buying? They're buying the precious metals. So I'm sure I won't be the first person who's pointed out that uh, fact to you. So we're actually seeing people shifting away from the smelly child, which is the debt, who used to be the banner cool boy of the house. And that is a big, big problem. Because how do you, everybody, realize the same thing at the same time and not have a disorderly set of events? And this is why the central banks are actively working to keep the debt market up because it is your currency. And when they let the debt markets go, they will also be letting the money go. And that then ties into the reset sniper and the crypto sniper, which is the reset world, your new money system and how, how big a surveillance tool it is and everything else. So we're trying to paint you a very big picture. All of these things aren't coincidences, in my opinion. They are orchestrated. The debt market is being held up. The big, the most perverse example, Jay, is the Japanese. You've got to remember, they don't have commodities. They import everything. 
They import oil. They import, um, you know, just about everything they do. They have to import. Yes, they grow a little bit of uh, things, but they're not a big country. They are holding up with a terrible demographic at 0.5% interest rate. An unbelievable balloon. They've already about 260%. By the way, America is worse with its liabilities, but let's just focus on them. They don't have the global privilege of uh, currency of the world. They are holding up almost going on 300% of their total GDP, and they're only paying 0.5% on it. And there's no way that the average Japanese person is only experiencing half a percent in inflation. Uh, and so we get statistics, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And that then brings us to, if the minute you start questioning these things, you've got to look at the non-farm payrolls. You've had 12 beats in a row. Only problem that many people don't realize, and that, by the way, goes beyond. I've got stats since 1966. I've actually, this is Daily Shot. This is not my work. This is a chart quickly for everybody. Beats on the non-farm roll. You go back to 96 here, and I think we could go a lot further, and you've never seen such outstanding labor performance. What you're not hearing is that retrospectively, those non-farms are actually being adjusted below the, the expectation that everybody treated as a beat afterwards. So we're getting lies, damn lies, and statistics in inflation, which is why I follow shadow stats, uh, which is the Ronald Reagan's 80s era, uh, and all of these things. So people are maintaining a pantomime that is already falling apart. People often ask me, when's reset? I'm saying, you're busy experiencing it. People just aren't admitting it to you, but you're busy experiencing it. Anyway, let me uh, let you come back in because I've taken you on a lot of journeys there. Yeah, no, you have, but I've been uh, just interested to follow along. And so walking through a couple of these calls then, Francis, you know, we began with the gold chart and you made your case for $2,900 gold as the next, uh, you know, fundamental level that we'll probably hold before maybe a follow-up breakout. Um, if I heard you correctly, speculating somewhere around $3 oil, did I gather that number? Upper correctly? 30s, low 40s, yes. We, uh, it'll be in the Dixie in measure, which is 102. It's going to be around 38, 39. It can overshoot to the downside. It will have been a failure of target performance if it doesn't run there, which still can happen. Do those two numbers need to correlate? You know, does the gold price need to respond to um, global recession, demand destruction in order to hit that $2,900 level? So therefore, can we have one without the other? When I walk through your thesis a little bit, is is all of this very dependent on an well, a pretty deep global recession? Yes, and uh, no. So the technical target is entirely independent of fundamentals. It tends to fall run uh, ahead of the fundamentals regularly. Um, the key point I will make is that I would expect gold to go down. We've already shown you it's looking tired. Uh, and I would expect it to go down in a demand-destroying event too. The problem is everybody comes under great stress. They will sell Bitcoin. They will sell gold as well. If you can't make a rent check or you're battling to buy groceries or pay things and you can't get credit extended on your credit card, a lot of the, the family silver goes. Um, so you, everything will have. You saw it also in March 2020. Gold dipped. It, the, the really strong things shrug it off because they are monetary substitutes, whilst oil, non-monetary substitute, crashed. Yeah. Uh, so we've got the same oil and gold trade uh, again. There's one other thing that I didn't quite show you in, in all of that, in that um, the uh, head and shoulders that we got uh, on oil, there's also against gold. So I treat gold as real money. Uh, and I encourage other people, value in gold ounces, think of that, because you're a monkey on a greased pole. It doesn't matter which country you're in, you're on a French greased pole or a European one, you're on an American one, it doesn't matter. So we're all clambering up greased poles. Some of them are more greasy than others. So if you're in the emerging market and the Turkish lira, it was a super slide. Um, but those people learned a lot faster and they were more prepared now, nowadays, for what's actually coming. So they all will be, they already have very established black markets for dollars, for gold, and for Bitcoin. Uh, and I think you're going to see that mirrored into the States, into the North American, into the Commonwealth, uh, larger Western conurbation. And I think these nations are the nations that are probably going to have the hardest hit 
because we are the softest belly of middle class dim comfort that is going to really get taken um, down quite some degree uh, in all of that. I will show you this technical uh, aspect one more time, and I'm going to divide it by this is gold uh, oil divided by uh, gold. So what is the price of oil in gold and could it go down? Remember, one is potentially monetizable in a time that everybody is losing faith in a faith-based money system. And the other is a, a demand, a consumer-related uh, proxy of economic activity. Both are commodities. Um, and you will see that uh, it doesn't, it, it, it's, a, it, it's got very similar technical aspects. It's really refreshing because I don't spend a lot of time looking at charts, frankly. You know, I'm, I'm a very people-driven investor and I tend to invest in entrepreneurs that I can get to know. And then dive into the value propositions of their companies and and whatnot but um maybe proximity of where i live or just my business model you know i'm, I'm very very human driven investor so this is, is i think it's very good often. you know you want to feel people you can see the whites of people's eyes and i have that within me too and i think it's a very honorable thing and you can uh find uh you know true common uh you know uh, sense of common uh, will and good pe quality people. Sometimes you have to watch something that is totally unemotional that you can't bond to and will give you bad news when you least want to hear it. And you've got to say, I'm going to take the message however it comes. It's almost like it's almost like going for a reading with a clairvoyant. Uh, of course, the interpretation is not always 100% accurate and you still have some power. But just to illustrate again, uh, and let me make sure I'm sharing again because I stopped the share. Um, if I will show you the previous events and where we are again today, because I've made the claim, we think there is a higher than likely. So we are probability-based scenario casting. Uh, we don't say absolutely anything. You can't say anything absolute about the future. So on balance of probabilities, we said you want to be long gold and short oil. There's that head and shoulder. Uh, and there was the spill of the events uh, that led you to a technical zero, because you divided by zero. I mean, this is the biggest swing you've ever seen between two commodities, because you, you got to a point where one was literally worthless because there was no place to put it. And he, then we recovered, as you would, because everybody needed to get back to work. And then you have the, you have the situation where we are today. We've already had one uh, smaller head and shoulder here. That's a neckline over there. That's brought you back down to this relationship. I've only got one decimal place here, but it's 0.04. In other words, one um, one ounce of gold will uh, one barrel will buy you 0 0.4 uh, 0 0.04 of an ounce of gold. So you would need quite a few barrels to get a single ounce. And what you've actually got again is you've got the same structure uh, where this is a much larger head. And this is pointing to demand destruction. And it seems people are trying to keep it up, but they're being overwhelmed. These selling, these buy the dip wicks are occurring by people not really understanding. But why is oil going down? You know, it takes a lot of energy to, to mine and also to uh, chase oil. So there's a similar structure that could see this go down quite some way into this virgin territory again. And it's not bullish. It's not bullish for the global economy, in my opinion. It's bullish for real established historical monetary substitutes, like or, or the original. Let's not call it the substitute. Everything else is a substitute. Fiat was the substitute that was initially derived off gold, and then that tie was removed. So we're going back to real money, in, in essence, potentially in that chart. And that's what I'm illustrating to you. Are we at that fulcrum where we're about to plunge again? Interesting. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to dive into one comment you made about, about the debt markets and essentially said when they let the debt and the money go, right, that will point us to our, our next step in the reset. And then you segue into, and that's where crypto maybe plays a role. You know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but the reason I want to jump into that is because my audience is pretty um, exposed probably to the precious metals sector. You know, I, I buy physical gold and silver and um, and very exposed to the equities as i know you are as well so therefore i want to hear your perspective on crypto's role in in today as an anti-fiat and in any speculative reset you see that might occur i'd love to get that take yes so precious metals uh, role i think is very well established and i think it's the safest place 
Uh, that said, as I've highlighted, it can go down in paper price on account of people will be forced into shortages of cash and fiat, and, th and they will make nonsensical transactions under pressure. So many times you are holding a great position in a trading desk that you bought the stock market. It's already crashed so far, but it's crashing more. They tap you on the shoulder. They say, you've got to close your positions. The banks closed your liquidity. So you're forced to close something that you know in a year. You never know, but in a year it's going to be up. So you can have that situation in gold. So the key thing for precious metals holders before I answer the crypto question is do not have the controlled demolition nanothermites in your financial uh, balance sheet that is loan equity where you are paying interest. Reduce that. It is the dangerous weapon. They can bring about an absolute interest rate spike that is brought by means outside of your hands. If you have a highly leveraged vehicle and you can't make the payment, you're not. It's never mind credit scores. It's about you become forced sellers of good things where good money is given up to plug gaps caused by bad. So deleverage, get out of leverage, owe nobody anything, particularly unstable institutions that have very kind terms and conditions to themselves written up. Crypto. Crypto is a good holding to have as well, and I do hold it. My concerns are more uh, ideological, uh, so they come down to surveillance and freedom. Uh, they come down to the fact easily registrable and trackable, so that opens the question, what about secrecy coins? Well, I always say, are they captured? Uh, so some people ask about Monero. Uh, I'm this fluffy pony. What, you know, the, they grabbed him when he was in the States. What happened there? Um, so I, I work on anything that's digital. You, your safety assumption is people know how much, the, the wrong people, if you are that interesting to them, will know how much you have or will have a means to find out. Uh, and I'm I in this perverse time which is a dangerous period this is a transition we are living through a transition the end of an entire book i spoke a book ended in bookshelves we're falling off a shelf onto another one below so there's a bungee jump that's going down at some point if you'll follow the metaphor and we've got to survive that fall and there's a lot of aggression and potential totalitarianism that will come out of statisms uh, entities and the people behind them so when you are digital you are reliant on grid, you're reliant on mobile or internet network, you're reliant on a lot of things. Having said all of that, I don't believe in having single horse. You should have a stable of horses. And actually, the fastest horse is a crypto in terms of appreciation, but it has also those weaknesses. A racehorse can get easily lame. So it's good to have a cart horse that's big, solid, cold blood, never gets injured, pull all day, but it's not the fastest unit. So that could be your precious metals. So have an, a stable of horses, and I, I encourage people to do cryptos. And our community is based on when to hold which ones. Uh, and we're not day traders. This is uh, more investment. And we do relative assessments. So much as you've seen me show you gold and oil versus this, I'm comparing Ethereum to Bitcoin. When is Bitcoin dominant? And we've asserted Bitcoin dominance for the last three or four months. And you've seen that. And now we're at a key point. Is it breaking out? We have a view on what, when Ethereum moves and there are other uh, tokens. So cross uh, referencing cross valuations, 360 degree analysis all the way around. So we macro and also cross referencing, referencing is very important. And you get beautiful technical clues if you care to look at the charts. I want to tell people where I can point them to to find more of your work, Francis, if they're curious about uh, the reset sniper, crypto sniper, or market sniper. Where should we point them today? Yeah, thank you very much for that opportunity. So should anybody wish to be part of a, a very enlightened wealth building reset community, uh, the marketsniper.com is where you can book a call. We like to speak to everybody before. We're not about get rich quick. The slow dough is the dough that stays. Uh, this is not a fast and furious trade feed. However, we teach you HVF method and we implement it in front of you, warts and all, uh, the losses, the winners. Um, and we help people with other aspects as well, which is also about protection. So that gets into structures, not being solely whole, wholly owned by one country. Don't be a country's asset. Remember your tax revenue. Uh, much of the law has been written in an essence that you are owned. Go where you treat it best, which is usually where you're a tourist. So have options. 
but that, that's there. If you just want to catch a drift of what we're all about, follow the market sniper for traditional markets or the crypto sniper, both on YouTube and on Twitter for what we're looking at and what we're calling in terms of uh, the various markets. Those calls come out later. Obviously, communities serve first. Don't be one country's asset. I love that. Mm. Great line. Okay, Great. look, I want to thank you for your time, Francis. Thanks for coming on the show and, and chatting with me today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having us on. I've thoroughly enjoyed it.